Windows 11 keeps changing its mind on what it's supposed to be. Data caps are like food. You shouldn't eat that much. And the worst name chip of all time that was just festered in a marketing laboratory finally gets benchmarked. Strix Halo. Let's get to the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Wednesday, December 11th, 2024. Quick reminder, we do have the PC giveaway happening on Twitch. I'm gonna pick it up and bring it back over here. And it's this one, 9950X4080 Super. We're gonna be drawing the winner for this next Thursday, uh, December 19th, in case you wanna tune in for that, twitch.tv forward slash UFD Tech. Would love to have you over there. And I would love to, understand what Microsoft's trying to accomplish here because obviously the impending doom date for Windows 10 is happening October of 2025. And with that, Microsoft has come out in recent days and said that they're not gonna lower the requirements for Windows 11. You're gonna need a TPM 2.0 compatible CPU. It's non-negotiable for this and future versions of Windows, which is pretty consistent with what they've been saying up until that point in history. However, as of yesterday, they came out and said that, uh, just kidding, uh, we're gonna revoke that. so. You can install it if you don't have TPM 2.0, but we're gonna let you know that you actually can't run it. We're gonna make it so that it has a little incompatible watermark, but you can now install Windows 11 on incompatible devices. So don't worry about it. Everything Microsoft said and it being a non-negotiable turns out that somebody negotiated it. So Windows 11, uh, in case you wanna upgrade to that to get the security features or whatever, once Windows 10 stops being updated regularly, that's gonna be available for you, or we can just continue to wait for Valve to make SteamOS available in a wide release. That's what I would like, but I'm gonna rest easy until that happens with today's video sponsor. It's been quite the year for both UFD Tech and me, just as Brett. I've expanded UFD Tech to a new office, hit a million on YouTube, and checked off another successful charity event. All of that sure does make a fellow tired. Luckily, Helix Sleep has been my mattress of choice for years, so I know I'm always gonna wake up refreshed and ready to let you know that they're also sponsoring this video. Getting started with Helix is probably one of the easiest things to do. Every Helix mattress comes in a box right to your front door, backed up by a 10 year warranty and a 100 night sleep trial. Oh, and the shipping is even free too. Setting up your mattress is also super easy. Just open the box, roll it out, and in a few minutes, your mattress is ready to catch some Zs. I think I'm, I'm supposed to say Zs because I'm American. But Helix also has a sleep quiz, which makes it so that you are paired with the ideal mattress for you. With over 20 unique mattresses in their lineup, including Helix Plus for big and tall sleepers, or the Helix Kids mattress designed for growing bodies, it's no wonder Helix is able to perfectly pair you to your mattress. Personally, I'm a slide sleeper while my wife likes to sleep on her stomach, so we got paired with the Dusk Lux mattress. In preparation for the charity stream in September, Helix was kind enough to provide two new mattresses for the new office, so Reese and Catelyn had some super comfy places to stay. Based on their respective Helix sleep quiz, Reese got paired with the Helix Dusk, being a back and stomach sleeper, while Catelyn matched with the Helix Sunset, being a side sleeper. While the Helix mattresses in the office have only been here a few months, I've had my Helix mattress for almost five years now. And as a long-term user, I find that when I travel, no mattress can compare to what I have at home. I can't imagine having anything other than a Helix mattress as my bed. So you can start your journey to better sleep today by checking out Helix Sleep down below. You click the link or go to helixsleep.com forward slash UFD tech for 20% off your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. And with over 20 award-winning Lux and Elite collection mattresses to choose from, you can guarantee that your perfect mattress will be waiting at your doorstep. Thanks to Helix, for sponsoring today's video. Oh man, I wish I was still in my Helix sleep bed dreaming about this because this is uh, some strange arguments that are coming out of ISPs arguing about whether or not they should have data caps for the amount of internet that they provide you. So the NCTA, which is an advocacy group on behalf of cable companies has been arguing with the FCC that data caps should be allowed, especially because the federal government is investigating whether or not data caps should be existing. So the NCTA, has come out in recent days and said things such as uh, usage-based pricing doesn't harm low-income users. It actually makes it so that they're more price competitive. Additionally, they have more options and for data companies to provide unlimited data is ridiculous because that would be like requiring coffee shops to supply unlimited free refills or a soup bowl to have free soup all of the time. And they need to be able to differentiate their various models in what they provide as a service by the amount of data 
that you receive. So this is the way that they should be able to do this. The FCC has said that they've gotten plenty of comments about how this is the exact opposite of what the NCTA and other cable companies are saying, which is that they get charged a lot more, it's unfair to a lot of people, and it actually makes competition worse. So while the federal government's investigating this, obviously this is gonna take some time before anything takes effect, and obviously there's an administration change coming up in about a month that could potentially alter how this is going. But I just wanna point out the wrinkle that I have with the analogy that data companies are using when it comes to like, oh, you wouldn't require a coffee company to require free refills. And while that is true, they charge based on the usage amount. They charge based on how much you get. What they don't charge on is the flow rate of the coffee. So you can get the coffee in the cup but you get it really quickly. They don't say, hey, you have to pay for us to pour it quickly and you have to pay extra for us to give you more. It's not both. It's the same thing with various other public utilities that are out there when it comes to at least typical consumer uh, water in the United States. You don't pay for the flow rate, you pay for the usage. You have a pipe that's hooked up to the city in, in a lot of cases, and then they, you just get what they give you. You're not paying for the flow rate. There are you know differences that you could have for like commercial businesses and all that kind of stuff. Additionally, with something like electricity, I'm not paying my power provider to give me a uh, higher bandwidth of electricity that I can use. I just pay for the usage that I have. Obviously, you can install uh, more robust infrastructure to do that, but for a regular consumer good of electricity, I am paying for the amount that I use, not the flow of the electricity or the flow of the water. Or when I buy based on usage when it comes to food or other items, I'm buying based on the usage, but not necessarily the uh, capacity with which they deliver it to me, which is kind of what data companies want. They want to be able to charge based on the bandwidth that they give you, how fast you get internet, and then double dip on that and charge you based on the usage. So you have to pay in segments for both sides, both the speed at which it's delivered to your house, as well as the amount that you use, which I think is where their argument falls apart. They, they, they're trying to charge on both sides and whether or not that increases competition and is better for the economy as a whole is a completely separate argument, but their argument that it would be like doing these other things, I think falls flat and is, isn't quite the case. But I'm gonna take a moment to recover from that brand uh, while you guys go check out what Reese has for good deals for you. Yo, welcome back to UFD Deals, bringing the hottest tech deals out on the internet. It is Wednesday, my dudes, and of course that means we have some deals for you today. Starting off with this Corsair IQ SP120 RGB Elite Triple Fan Kit going for only $31.99, it $48 off. And if you know anything about the price of Corsair fans, usually just over $10 per fan is one heck of a deal. But then next up, we have the Elgato Stream Deck Neo, which is my favorite Stream Deck in the lineup, simply because it's got the little push page buttons. You can pick one up for only $79.99, making it $20 off. And then lastly, today we have this NOCN 27 inch 4K 160 Hertz mini LED monitor going for only $449.99, making it $200 off. And hey, with that, the deals are done. You can find these and more linked in the video description down below. But until next time, I'm gonna hand you back to Brett for the rest of your hotness. Cheers. Oh, well, Reese, here's the deal with the new Strix Halo APUs. This is something that I'm very excited about. I love APUs, have loved them for a very long time. They're very near and dear to my heart. Strix Halo is gonna be the big Mac Daddy one. It's supposed to have 40 compute units of RDNA 3.5 with 16 Zen 5 cores. That's that's a great chip, all right? This is, we're talking about like a, a mega console level chip that's just gonna be delivered in a sleek, slim form factor. But I will remind you that the naming scheme that AMD is choosing to go with for this Strix Halo chip, the one that we have the benchmark of now is Ryzen AI Max Plus 395. They shoved so much marketing in there. It is ridiculous how much that they could cram into that small little space of just naming something. But regardless of all of the plus max AI that they're uh, cramming into the little nomenclature, it turns out that this thing is at least decently fast based on the initial geek bench benchmark that has made its debut out on the internet. Obviously we can't take a whole lot of extrapolated data from this because this is the initial benchmark, but we are seeing it pop up, which bodes well for this potentially releasing, hopefully, Q3 of 2025 is gonna be my guess on when this comes out. If I follow AMD's laptop launches at all, what will likely happen is they will announce it 
at CES, so we'll get an early January announcement. They say it will come in the first half of 2025, but what will end up happening is we're gonna get to the middle of June, there's gonna be no sight of it, and they're gonna delay it probably till like August or September, and it'll end up being more of a Q3 launch than the first half. This is how AMD launches every single laptop. Go back to every CES announcement for the last few years and you will see that that is basically the cadence they have. Announcement, audacious release dates, and then delay to make it so that it kind of fizzles out in terms of hype. But the AI Max 300, the Vulcan score that we see in Geekbench is actually equivalent, actually slightly faster than an RTX 4060 laptop. So coming in with a score of 67,000, whereas the 4060 laptop is about 64 and a half thousand. So in an APU, you get 16 cores, as well as a GPU that potentially is better than a discrete graphics card that you would find elsewhere. This has the potential of being a very powerful chip being put into a wide variety of use cases. Many PCs, I would love to see have this AI Max Plus Hydra Dip Super Chip. It, it, it could be really cool in that. I, I would also love to see it in a handheld. I understand battery life is gonna be wonky because this will be a 120 watt part, so you're not gonna have great battery life. You're gonna get less than an hour at full consumption, even if you shove a 99 watt hour battery in there. But I kind of want one just so I could like be tethered to the wall, like a Steam Deck form factor, but it, the screen, it's all there, and then I'm just, I'm plugged in all the time. It's kind of like a, a Game Gear back in the day where that thing just chowed through battery. Same exact thing. I want an, a, a ridiculously gaudy handheld with super powerful capacity that I can't stay away from the wall for. I, I want to see that happen. If any company wants to do that, I probably will buy one. But you guys uh, bought the words that I said. I'm segueing to comment response. I'm sorry for whatever that was. First comment, it says, first gen Ryzen is almost eight years old. Time sure flies. Yeah, it's uh, it's wild. I think the Ryzen 7 1700X was one of the very, very first review samples that I got ahead of time when I first started this channel in South Africa. I believe it was Wootware who sent me the chip and then Asus South Africa sent me the motherboard. It was like the Crosshair 7 Hero, Crosshair 8 Hero. I can't remember what, what number it was, but the 1700X, um, very, very near and dear to my heart because it's one of the, the first chips that I, I, I had enough clout to finally get a seated sample for. It was it was exciting times. Uh, additionally, uh, I had that happen with the Threadripper 1950X, really like that. So that was a lot of fun times way back when. It's approaching a decade old. Ryzen, Ryzen's getting a little long in the tooth. But a few of you are getting long in the tooth waiting for your 9800X 3D. Sherbet saying, the more I hear about the 9800X 3D, supply issues. I can't help but feel instantly lucky that I checked Amazon 15 minutes before the sale was supposed to go live. Bought it early and I had it in my hands that weekend. You Insanely lucky. But Agent Zippo saying, Still waiting on my 9800X 3D. Bought it from Mine Factory, and so far the estimate for the delivery is late December. There's still hope that I will spend my end of year vacation playing on my new build. I really hope so. I really hope so. And the Necromancer saying, ordered my 9800X 3D on Amazon for recommended retail price on the 18th of November. Just received shipping note. It arrives this Friday, 13th of December. Love the omen. But really, not that bad slash long to wait considering the worldwide craze slash buying season slash demand. I hope it comes in on Friday. I hope everybody gets to enjoy these ships as they have time to enjoy them. And then we got Gamshot Boy saying, your head look glass like shiny in thumbnail. Appreciate it. Thank you. And then draw Senate saying, my wife and I are in the hospital for our first baby. This should help pass time. Congratulations. This is gonna be completely unprompted and you probably didn't ask for any advice, but as I'm now having uh, my fourth child after uh, having my first child over 13 years ago, uh, there's a big difference in how, you know, I'm, I'm approaching uh, just the, the care and affection and like um, mindset around this newest one. And I think one of the things that I'm realizing is I was way more stressed out for the first one. I thought like every little cry, every little, um, you know, thing that you think could be wrong just kind of uh, puts you on guard. And I don't have that very much at all with this this fourth one because I like I've been through it. I know a lot of this stuff is normal. So relax, enjoy it, have a good time. Uh, Congratulations. And then the theory guy says, geez, 30% not a big uplift. This is in regards to the B580 from the A580, to which I defended this saying, yeah, for a 37% price increase, it's not a big uplift because you could have already gotten 
that type of performance increase. To go from an A580 plus 30%, you're looking at an A770. You could find those for $250 use. You could also buy something like an RTX 2080 Ti with 11 gigabytes of VRAM. You could buy a couple of other AMD GPUs that cl get close to 12 to 16 gigabytes of VRAM that are the exact same performance for $250. So yeah, the 30% uplift seems good in terms of spec for spec, A580 to B580, but when they raise the price from $170 to $250, you're paying for that increase, which you could have already done with another gaming company. And then lastly, we got Snek saying, fix your Stadia controller, to which I responded, no. Then they said, do it. No, not gonna do it. It's gonna sit right there. I'm not gonna do anything with it. It's not gonna be useful for Bluetooth. I'm gonna be the person that keeps Google extending this deadline where they just keep allowing you to update your Stadia controller until 2090. And I'm uh, done updating this hot news. I'll see you back here tomorrow for more of the hottest tech news then. Bye.